Thank you, Ijoma. Welcome to the world of business. The success in the subscription of the nation's $1 billion Eurobond program has been described as an indication of Nigeria's significance to investors. The chief economist at PricewaterhouseCoopers, Dr. Andrew Nevin, who made this comment on our business program earlier today, said the subscription is not enough to meet the nation's demands. Well, I, th I mean, I think it's good news. Mm -hmm. We can go out and we can, we can borrow some money. Um, but I think we need to keep in perspective we're borrowing a billion dollars. I'm not worried about that from the viewpoint of debt. We have low debt. We have lots of oil. We have lots of opportunities. Um, uh, so we can repay it. But I think people also need to remember $1 billion is a very small amount. I mean, we have a 100 trillion Naira economy. Uh, that's over 300 billion at the interbank rate, $300 billion economy. So borrowing $1 billion is not going to fix all our problems. But we're a big, serious economy. Uh, everyone wants to be interested in us. I mean, the fact that people got less interested with our own I mean, we got knocked out of the index, as you say, and we've had some policies that have made it difficult for outside investors to come in. But if we make it just a little bit easier, they are going to come in and they're going to bring the money we need, which is a lot more than a billion dollars. The acting managing director of the Bank of Industry, Mr. Wahid Olagunju, says the bank is willing to assist owners of small businesses in the textile and fashion industry to access the one billion naira earmarked for the sector. Mr. Lagunji, who was speaking at a meeting in Abuja, says the initiative is part of efforts to grow the non-oil sector of the economy. Meanwhile, the Minister of State for Industry, Trade and Investment, Mrs. Aisha Abubakar, says the federal government is putting measures in place to address its infrastructural deficit as part of its drive towards improving exports. We have challenges, but we are working on these challenges. I know there's going to be some hydropower projects around the Kaduna. I know the gas project around the Eagles Group area is also coming up. I know we're also working on some of the infrastructure. And as I said, the special economic services will take care of some of these uh, infrastructure issues that can be, can be done with help. An entrepreneur who comes to the bank with potentially viable products, potentially viable projects, we have the one billion naira fashion fund which we are willing to increase as demand also increases. So that's just a starting point. So say let's start with the one billion naira fund. But if you have requests with uh, potentially viable uh, proposals, we're ready to collaborate with other development partners, in fact, including the African Development Bank, because ADB also has a package for Africa's uh, fashion designers, and we're also collaborating with the African Development Bank in this respect. With cautious optimism on the minds of investors today trading on the local boards closed positive by a slim margin amid mixed performance from some key stocks. Harriet Agwenyi has the summary of today's transactions. The Nigerian stock market inched up marginally as investors favorably traded oil and gas as well as banking stocks. The main index rose by 0.07% to close Friday's session at 25,340.02, the second positive performance this week. Market capitalization is still around 8.76 trillion naira. Market breadth was also positive as there was 19 gainers led by Air Services, Access Bank, and better glass as against 10 losers led by livestock feed. Banking stocks, Union Bank of Nigeria, Fidelity Bank, and Access Bank were the three most actively traded at today's session. In 2,604 deals, total market volume came in at 201.72 million shares, valued at 2.58 billion naira. Those are today's trading figures. I'm Harriet Agbini. Let's cross over to the U.S. market now, where stocks in Wall Street hit another record at the start of trades today. With more details from the Nasdaq market site in New York, as VOA Channel TV business correspondent Jill Malandrino. U.S. stocks traded to fresh all-time highs in the first hour trade. This is a day after all three major U.S. benchmarks set record-closing highs as markets remain buoyed by hopes from President Trump, who yesterday 
promised phenomenal announcements about his tax plan in the next two to three weeks. After a slow start to fourth quarter earnings season, a solid 69% of S&P 500 companies that have reported have now bested consensus estimates, pushing the year-over-year -year earnings growth rate for the S&P 500 to over 8%. That's nicely above the 6% consensus growth rate as of January 1st. Now, today's session could be dominated by further political headlines as Trump is due to hold a meeting with Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe at 1 p.m. Eastern. Turning to the trading week ahead, of course, all eyes will remain on Trump and macro policies. The Fed moves back into the spotlight with a slew of speakers on the circuit, including Chair Janet Yellen, who will give her semi-annual testimony to the House panel on Wednesday at 10 a.m. The earnings calendar is starting to wind down with mostly cable and technology names reporting for next week. From the Nasdaq Market Site in New York, I'm Jill Malandrino, and this is VOA Channel's Business News. Well, global markets traded mostly higher today, closing the week in positive territory, of course, except for London FTSE, as investors tracked more earnings and reacted to the meeting between U.S. President Donald Trump and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe at the White House today. But let's check out the numbers. <laughs> Thank you for watching Business News tonight. I am Anne Mwawadu. It's back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Anne. Members of the House Committee on Port Privatization and Commercialization have visited Jospadam Port Services at Tinkan Island in Lagos. Now, they came in response to a complaint written by Honeywell Flour Mills PLC against the concessionaire of the Nigerian Ports Authority. In 2006, one of about 26 terminals in Tinkan Island, Apapa, was handed over to Joseph Dam with a 10-year lease. But the concessionaire complained it was not able to carry out developmental projects because of a conveyor belt belonging to Honeywell Flour Mills PLC on the premises, which Joseph Dam had asked them to pull down. JPS insists this request is in accordance with its lease agreement with the Nigeria Ports Authority. Consequently, NPA extended the lease by another five years, but Honeywell took the matter to the courts. Meanwhile, both parties claim that their financial obligations to NPA are met on time. When we realized that the objective of that project contradicts the existence of Honeywell in this environment, we then took our position that Honeywell is a bona fide tenant of NPA. We started business at least um, since year 1993. JPS is ready with its defense. The one structure which is now owned by Honeywell, previously from Multimol, is a redundant vegan, which they, which they keep forgetting to tell everybody. It is a redundant structure. It hasn't been used for several years. It cannot be repaired. It needs to be demolished. All stakeholders proceed to the terminal to understand better the claims of each party. All parties are aware that there's a limit to how much can be said and done with a matter that is in the courts. But the House Committee and JPS are hoping for an amicable solution. Hopefully, they will eventually accept to a resolution that will remove the case from the courts for us to be able to solve the problem once and for all. JPS is still faced with the responsibility of developing their terminal to acceptable standards. And it says a quick solution is imperative because time is running out. At least eight people have been confirmed dead in Zambara State, northwest Nigeria, following a clash between community members and suspected herdsmen in the Rukumat Safe local government area. The state police commissioner, Shabba Alkali, told journalists that the victims were on a peace mission on behalf of the district head of Safe, but were ambushed by gunmen. Sources close to the Zamfara state government also told Channels Television that all the people sent by the district head were killed by the suspected herdsmen. In July last year, President Muhammadu Buhari launched a special operation involving the Nigerian armed forces against cattle rustling, but the killings and destruction are yet to stop. 
to the fight against global terrorism where French authorities have prevented what could have been another terrorist attack in the country. The Interior Ministry says four suspects have been arrested in Montpellier in connection to the foil attack. Three men and one girl, probably aged 16. Anti-terrorist police caught them with bomb-making materials during a raid on a flat in the city. Among the suspects arrested by the police is a 20-year-old man and his 16-year-old girlfriend. Authorities had known about their connections with radical Islam and had gotten hints about the imminent attack. During their raid on a flat in Montpellier City, police found TATP explosives and other bomb-making materials in the man's home. France's interior ministry confirmed explosives were found in the flat. France has been preparing for presidential elections scheduled to hold in May this year. In the midst of the preparations, security remains uppermost. Since the beginning of 2015, at least 230 people have been killed in jihadist attacks in the country. Just last week, it was jolted to the reality of its security challenges when a 29-year-old Egyptian wielded a machete at soldiers at the Louvre Museum in Paris. Back to the present, local media say the four were planning to attack a tourist site in Paris, but police are yet to confirm the exact target. The girl among the group, it was found, recorded a video pledging allegiance to the so-called Islamic State. France's top constitutional court has struck down a law which penalized those who consult jihadist websites after the Constitutional Council found the law infringed on the people's freedom of communication unnecessarily.